Bubble plates, to bubble or not to bubble? I guess that's the question. Now I'm at the very end of this process here. I'm, I've tightened up all of my, uh, or I've snugged down these uh, retaining rods for my bubble plate. Now, uh, I had this apart earlier because I thought it would be, it was a good time since I hadn't used it in quite a while uh, to clean all of these copper downcomers. And um, so uh, let me show you that real quick. I just wanted to show you a comparison um, real quickly here. I have my 551 mixture. Um, that's that cleaning solution. We did a video on that real briefly. 500 milliliters of water. 50 milliliters of uh, hydrogen peroxide and one ounce by weight of citric acid and uh it, that just it cleans copper it it, it does a great job of, of really making it shiny now here's what i'm going to show you these two close up this is about 15 minutes of uh time uh from this to this with uh no scrubbing whatsoever so i've got those out i've, I've disassembled this and you can say I got pieces all over the place, but when we come back, it'll be assembled, and we're going to get into the anatomy of a bubble plate. So you can see that that now I've got them all clean, and I've got them reinstalled and reinserted. Um, and remember, yes, there is a right way, and then there is a wrong way. <laughs> of course, you've only got a 50-50 chance of getting this wrong or getting it right, depending on how you look at it. But you're, you should have one single downcomer per plate. And you'll notice that in here, in the other three, stick up. So I guess we call them up goers. Uh, I, I don't know. I, really, they're called downcomers. Uh, but in my mind, I look at the difference in direction. One's a downcomer, and the other one's an up goer. Big deal. Uh, and, and that's the way that this thing is designed. Now, what this allows you to do which is interesting, here, here kind of begs the question, uh, do you really want to use a bubble plate? Well, remember, every time you have an opportunity to do a separate distillation in one run, you should take advantage of it. What does that do? Uh, well, that makes your run more pure, which increases your uh, percentage, your proof, dramatically. Uh, why, why wouldn't you do it if you had the opportunity? Um, again, that's also if you're trying, look, if you're going to make a bourbon, um, you're trying to make a really good backyard whiskey, um, or you're trying to mimic something that you grab off the shelf, um, th this is probably not the answer for you, okay? Because we know that in a pot still, and if you do, if you're judicious and run that thing correctly, that's where you get the majority of your flavor, your characters, your aromas, and all those things. Uh, when we're using a bubble plate, um, this is more of an adaptation towards a reflux still. It's an addition. Um, you got to follow this because this is really, really unique and it's interesting. A lot of people get it confused and, that, and that's okay. Um, but... What we want to do is we want to have separate distillations take place at the same time. Yes, that. It, so in this particular case, now there is a formula to work out how many theoretical plates you have, but in this particular case, we have at least four physical plates. So we know that we have initially, we have exactly four separate distillations happening all at the same time. All right. Now, there are other influences that either increase or decrease your theoretical plates. Uh, as an example, that G-Still has 72 theoretical plates. Um, and that is the differences between packing, distance, physical uh, plates. It's all those things together. Uh, but in this particular case, we know we have the four to start with. Okay. Uh, now, and in each one of these, you'll see that you've got three of the downcomers that stick up, and a lot of activity takes place in each one of those. So, see, now that's where we start working towards our theoretical numbers, which telling us that we have more than just one distillation happening right here on this one single plate, because they're happening separately in three different locations. And then you have this downcomer. And this downcomer allows whatever bubbles up in this top 
plate to work its way down and fill up the second plate. Now in the second plate, you have an additional three. What am I getting at here? Right now I've got three times four, one is three. Three, three, and three. I've got at least 12 theoretical plates initially after my four. So I've got four plates and I've got three on each one. So that's what? 16. So you see where that, so you see how we get to that right now? I'm, I'm going to work with, and I'm comfortable saying I've got 16 theoretical plates in this one small portion of my column. All right, now that I've totally lost most, um, and that's okay. Please don't get wrapped around the axle about theoretical plates, physical plates, and all that. All you really need to understand is that we have multiple distillations taking place at the same time. Now, how does this actually work? The, the, the beauty behind this is, is the separation of the process on a stepping stone level or a stair step level. You'll have the top plate that will start to fill first, and as it does and starts to drop down to the second place, this one starts to bubble. There go the name bubble plate. And then it fills the next one. Now, as all of these get full and they all start to bubble and relatively violent, in a sense, they violently bubble. But what's happening is, is you've got all of your vapors that are traveling north, up. Okay, they're traveling up and they pass through to each one. And as they start to rise and get higher and higher, you have a deflagmator. And your deflagmator, see, that's this one has a bunch of tubes in the center of it that we run cold water through. It's a pre condenser. This has to be located here, otherwise, none of this can happen. Okay, none, none of this can happen without one of these. Now, we, this is a reflux chamber, better known as, if it's individually attached to it, stuck to it, it's called a deflagmator. Uh, a deflagmator or a reflux chamber, uh, the, the terms are really interchangeable. Uh, there, there is some history behind what a real deflagmator is, and we'll leave that for another video. Uh, but it, this has adopted that name as well. But... And I've had too many folks call or write in, and their challenge is, is they've got one of these, and that's great. That's great. And then they run, run it right off the top into a condenser. And, but they say that it's not bubbling. It won't do anything. It won't fill. Well, it can't. Recall that it, the only way that it can fill up is if it has something running back down in this direction. Where does that come from? It comes from the deflagmator. So we pre-condense, not fully condense, we pre-condense, which means that the vapors that travel into the deflagmator start to pre-condense. And the heavier substances, the water, that is also going to attract some of that ethanol is going to drop. It's going to pre-condense and drop back out. The most volatile substance, being the pure ethanol, is going to continue to travel out in through your condenser. Now, as it drops out and stops and meets on every one of these bubble plates, what happens is, is it starts to revaporize. But it revaporizes at a much pure state. So it revaporizes pure here, and that vapor rises, the excess drops off. It does the same thing here, the excess dropping off all the way back down until in the very bottom, what you have left here is you have such low ethanol content that this just drops back down in the bottom back into your kettle. It never makes its way into your condenser. So what you have is you start having more pure, more pure, more pure, and more pure ethanol continuing to flow out through your deflagmator and into your condenser, thereby giving you the higher proof that you are trying to achieve. Now, I pulled up an old video of one that I did. I, I ran this right here, as a matter of fact. Let me, let me show you. Watch this, because this will kind of open up. This will explain exactly what's going on. You'll get to see it. All right, well, I've got my chiller working in the background, so you'll hear that. I uh, hope that doesn't interrupt you. But now you'll see that when I've got this oriented right, you, you notice how this plate fills and it fills that plate, it fills that plate, it fills that plate. Now, what, look at all this bubbling action that's taking place. 
Now I'm going to turn my deflagmator down just a little bit because I've got what I have is full condensing going on right here. And I just want that to dance and then start to produce. Now you, now it's pretty it's pretty obvious to watch this now. You can see how each plate is loading. Um, and I've got a separate distillation that happens at each level, if you'll notice this. Uh, take this one for example. Uh, everything that's right, that has risen and risen through this plate and hit the deflagmator is dropping back down and it's re-vaporizing here. And all, that's all those bubbles. It's re-vaporizing. That's just water and it's dropping back down to the next plate and it's doing the same thing as it works its way down and anything left over that I don't want is dropping back down in the column. Um, and if you look close, you can see it actually dripping right out of the deflagmator and it's keeping those plates loaded. So we're just gonna allow that to run. I've got this thing set at 175 degrees. Uh, right now it's 155.1. I'm just gonna let it run. So you see how, how precise that becomes? Um, it's not as precise, not even, not really complicated when you think about it. Remember, we were controlling the water flow that goes in here and comes out here. So that is separate from the condenser itself. And that's why we always say that you run your condenser just full bore, just let it go. Your deflagmator or your reflux chamber, you have to meter the water. So you control the water flow in order to create this downstream that fills your bubble plates and causes them to flood. And by just us, and you'll you'll even notice on that controller that I had there, you'll notice that when I change the temperature, when I change the flow, you'll notice that the temperature changed slightly. Uh, that's all an effect. So there's that there's that delicate balance between temperature and water flow that allows you to draw out the most pure spirit that you possibly can. That's where we get our 95, 96% um alcohol by volume into our spirit jar that's how we get that uh, otherwise we're, we're 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 struggling and struggling and struggling to get there but when you finally get that balance um it, it's a beautiful thing so oh just in review now so remember that if, if you've got a bubble plate these things are amazing they are not that difficult to operate but you must have some sort of a pre-condensing chamber that actually causes that downflow and that fills and floods your plates. Uh, these come in three inch models, four inch models, two inch models. Uh, you can get them just about anywhere. Uh, this, these are, this is a four physical plate. That's probably my limit. Um, yeah, I've seen them with as many as 12. Uh, can you imagine? You're not, you're, you're only going to get so pure. Remember that. Scientifically, you're only going to get so pure because we have what's known as an azeotrope. Uh, and that azeotro azeotropic blend of ethanol and water uh, is greater at the bottom, but when you get to the end of the run, it actually meets itself at that one point, which is called the azeotrope itself, where you have equal amount of ethanol and an equal amount of water. And that is not going to exceed a little over 96%. I hope that explanation makes sense to everybody. But until next time, yes, happy distilling.